Okay, so welcome everyone to our CTLT Institute session entitled Students as Partners in Course Redesign, Reflections from Student, Faculty and Staff Partners on Learning Through Partnership. We, I speak on behalf of our wonderful panel, are really delighted to have so many folks here this morning um, and hopefully expressing an interest or curiosity around partnership. Um, and we're really delighted to share our experiences working in partnership through the um, UBC Students as Partners Initiative funded projects with you today. I want to um, begin by inviting my colleague Polina to um, provide a land acknowledgement this morning. Thank you, Rosalind. Hi, everybody. Um, let's just kick things off by acknowledging the land that we're on. Um, everyone might be coming from different locations today, um, but we're stationed on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations, who are the traditional caretakers of these lands. Um, and that's something uh, we wanna think about and align ourselves and our actions and how we navigate um, our time here today and beyond. Thank you, Paulina. Um, I wanna just take a moment to uh, have our panel moderators introduce themselves briefly. Um, so Marissa, would you like to turn on your camera wave yeah. and, and just briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm um, excited to be here. So my name is Marissa and I am the Students as Partners Evaluation Specialist. So I do all kinds of evaluation work for this fund. Um, and uh, I'm also a PhD student here at UBC. So um, great to be here today and lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Paulina? Hi again, um, my name is Paulina. I use she, her pronouns. I am the student coordinator for the Students as Partners Fund. I work with Marissa and Roslyn uh, as a, and others, um, and uh, the day-to-day -day tasks um, and duties of, of what it means to sustain partnership, nurture partnership. Um, so if you see me around, it's oftentimes for support with that kind of work. Thanks, Polina. And hi everyone, my name is Rosalind Verwood and I'm the strategist for the Students as Partners Initiative and um, have had the privilege of being able to um, mount this initiative at UBC and to engage with the folks that are doing this really important and meaningful and potentially transformative work. Um, I wanna just briefly also talk about our agenda for today before I then introduce the panelists and turn things over to them. So um, our session today, we're here till about 1230, and we will take some time to kind of contextualize partnership and the students as partners initiatives. So kind of what is this concept of partnership and how do we conceptualize students as partners? We'll then turn things over to have a, uh, the panelists speak to their experience being involved in partnership projects um, here at UBC through the students as partners in course design grants. And at the end, we'll hopefully have time for a bit of summary. What were the key themes that came out of the panel? Um, and then Marissa will spend a few minutes just talking about some preliminary data that she's gathered around the impact of this initiative here at UBC. And we'll end with a chance to highlight um, some upcoming events that may be of interest um, if you want to further your learning and community building in this Students as Partners field. And that will wrap up our time together. We've got a, a full, very packed, back to, packed uh, hour and a half together. Great. So I'm gonna just um, stop sharing maybe just for a moment and just invite our, uh, our panelists to briefly say hello um, before we uh, get into a bit of an overview of the initiative. So um, we have a number of panelists here today. They will each get a chance to speak about their experiences. So in, in no particular order, I'm going with the order on my screen. Um, I would just like to actually introduce, um, sorry, Selena, and I'm just gonna pull up the, the slides. Just give me one second again. 
I realized uh, I need those slides. And there we go. There we go. Um, so Selena, can you turn on your camera and, and just wave hello to everybody? Yep. Hello, I'm Selena Park. Wonderful. And Selena is a fourth year undergraduate student in pharmacology. Bosung, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm a learning designer from CTLT. Thank you, Bosung. And Natalie. Hi, everyone. I'm also a student partner with SAP. Uh, my name is Natalie, and I am a Bachelor of Science and Forest Science student. Thank you. And the three of uh, them, Selena, Bosung, and Natalie worked on a project, a Students as Partners funded project called Implementing Course Mastery Tracking Through Student Revised Learning Objectives for Forestry 304. Um, and they'll talk more about their experiences in a minute. Um, Roslyn, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Roslyn. I'm a student partner um, and I am studying undergrad uh, visual arts and psychology. Wonderful. Thank you, Christine. Hi, I'm Christine D'Onofrio. I'm faculty in visual arts. Thank you. And Annika. Hi, uh, my name's Annika. I uh, go by day she, and I am um, just finished my fifth year. Um, I'm an undergraduate student in visual arts, economics, and informatics. Wonderful. Thank you. And the three of them worked on a project called Decolonizing the Studio Critique, exercises to promote community in the visual art classroom. And they'll be speaking about that later. And our last group, uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm a learning designer at CTLT. Thanks, John. Gail? Uh, I'm Gail, uh, Associate Professor of Teaching in Food, Nutrition, and Health. Thank and I'll you. just say and that Amber and Lucy were not able to be here today, uh, but Amber is a year four student and Lucy has recently graduated. Thank you. And we've got their photos there as well. Thank you very much. We will hear more from our panelists shortly, but I wanted to just take this moment for them to introduce themselves um, and put names to faces. So before we get into hearing about their experiences, we wanted to spend just a few minutes contextualizing this notion of students as partners and to help folks understand how partnership is unique and perhaps uh, then to understand the panelists' experiences, you can make those connections. What is students as partners and how does that connect then to their lived experiences? So partnership for, for us here at UBC is a process of student engage, engagement involving faculty, students, and staff learning and working together. And the goal of that work is enhancing learning and teaching. Partnership is also a way of doing things rather than an outcome in itself. So when we think about partnership as a process where we are working together um, and we are the focus is on the, the partnership and the process of working rather than getting to a particular desired outcome. Obviously, we will do work together, we will produce outcomes, but there's more emphasis on, on the processes of working together and, and the ways that we come together to do all kinds of wonderful things related to teaching and learning. We typically see high levels of active student participation in partnership work um, and significant contributions from students in that work. We, we always highlight this quote that comes from uh, Ellison Cook Sather, who's a scholar in this field of students as partners. She's located in the U.S. at Bryn Mawr. Um, uh, and she talks about how students and faculty in partnership work have the opportunity to contribute equally, although not necessarily in the same ways to all aspects of enhancing teaching and learning. And that's really in recognition that students and faculty and staff have different expertise. Students bring expertise of what it means to be a learner, staff bring expertise of what it means to be perhaps pedagogical experts around teaching and learning, and faculty bring expertise of the subject matter and what it means to teach in that discipline. And we need all three of those lenses to really create perhaps the best learning experience for, for others. So contributing equally, although perhaps in different ways to the, the, the course design redesign work in this case. Why? Why this concept of students as partners? We know a few things from the research and the literature on teaching and learning. We know that there's 
importance and emphasis of students being actively engaged in their learning. It's a good thing for students to be engaged in their learning. We know that learners have expertise of what it means to be a learner. And we know that there's the potential to apply this knowledge to enhance teaching and learning, right? They have that knowledge. Why not fold it into making better enhanced teaching and learning experiences? And we know that there's a range of ways that students can be engaged in teaching and learning activities, both within the classroom and beyond all the things that happen as we develop courses and programs before they even get to um, the classrooms, before students get there to experience those things. Here's a couple of quotes, um, really just highlighting this, this first quote highlighting, um, if you're taking learning and the studying, uh, study of learning seriously as a transactional activity, it's not a productive inquiry if you do not have all the voices in that dialogue. It's a different kind of research if students are silent or if students are merely research subjects. So really emphasizing folding students into the whole process of the study of teaching and learning. And Sophia Abbott, who's actually going to be um, coming to, to UBC virtually on June 6th, and we'll talk more about that a little later, um, who was at Bryn Mawr College, talked about becoming more aware of how faculty do their jobs and the things that go on behind the scenes <laughs> before we perhaps come to that wonderful course or that wonderful program or that wonderful co-op experience or whatever it might be. Having more, more patience for the classroom setting as a result of participating in partnership work and more confidence for talking to professors as, you know, humans, real people. So there are lots of benefits. And again, we'll hear a bit more later today from Marissa, our evaluation specialist, on some of the uh, impacts and outcomes that this initiative is having here at UBC on the folks involved. When we think about um, student participation and active student participation, um, in the context of teaching and, learn, teaching and learning, we can use this uh, visual of a ladder where when we think about climbing the ladder, the, the bottom rung is perhaps the easiest to get, get up onto, <laughs> literally, if you climb a ladder. And in this framework from Bovel and Bully, who come from the UK, Kathy Bovel is another scholar in this field. Um, the bottom rung is really a dictated curriculum where students have no decision making, no say or control over what they uh, learn or experience in the curriculum. They show up and they're along for the ride, hopefully. As we move up the ladder, there's obviously more uh, student participation in the classroom and the course in the program design, so on and so forth. And as we get closer to the very top, which is, of course, harder to, to get to, harder to climb up, more fear, so on and so forth, we see partnership where really curriculum is negotiated. We are bringing in um, space for students to shape and say what they want to learn, how they want to learn it, so on and so forth. And at the very top, students have control over and substantial influence over the curriculum, really. Um, so partnership is the second from the top, which signal, signals significant active student participation and involvement. So what might partnership look like? We can think about concrete ways that, that partnership might take shape. Things like students and faculty partners working together to explore or research the student experience in a course to determine what changes we might need to make. So what were past students' experiences in this course? We might gather some data. We might use that data to um, analyze, revise what we're doing, the actual pedagogical approaches and strategies that we're using in the classroom, which might inf then require us to design or redesign a particular part or section of a course. We together might decide on the approach that we'll take and what dimensions of the course or teaching practices we'll focus on. And we might also identify needs to be addressed within the course. And how, for example, how to make courses more welcoming to a diversity of students, how to better engage students in answering questions, how to um, develop actions or strategies to address these needs. So we're figuring this out together based on information that we are gathering from our own experiences, from other students' experiences, perhaps other um, stakeholders, so on and so forth. So this is, these are some possibilities of, of what my partnership look like. We are going to pause here and now transition into the panel. 
hopefully this gives folks a sense of um, what partnership look, could look like, why partnership is important, and how we at UBC are taking up this notion of partnership um, in the context of teaching and learning. What we're going to do next is the panel, and we have put forward a number of questions that panelists will speak to. After each question, there'll be an opportunity for one or two questions from the audience. Um, so for housekeeping, just to let folks know, you're welcome to type your question into the chat and or raise your hand using the raise your hand function, and we'll pick up your question that way. If we have more questions than we're able to respond to, we are happy to collect those and do some follow-up responses over email to, to folks. Um, so that's something we wanted to offer. Any questions before we move forward to the panel? I just want to pause and just see if there's any burning questions for folks. Feel free to use the chat or quickly raise your hand. Either is fine. Any questions? Okay. So um, with that, we will um, begin our panel. So I get the pleasure of posing the first question to the panelists. Um, and the quest question that we have is sort of, um, we've already heard uh, that we have the opportunity here at UBC for students and, and staff and faculty to work in partnership um, to design or, or redesign a UBC Vancouver undergraduate course. Looking back, um, what interested you in the Students as Partners initiative? And can you briefly describe your funded Students as Partners project? So Gail, would you like to start us off? Sure, I'll do that. Thanks, Rosalind. So uh, when I look back, what interested me in a nutshell, I'm going to say, is that we have the end user's voice of resources that we develop involved in the development of those resources right from square one. So uh, if I look back at my own personal history as a public health dietitian in community practice before coming to academia, I always developed resources from a professional perspective. We focus group people and then we got their response. That always, I always struggled with that. When the students as partners initiative came along, I was going, okay, the UBC is committed to funding the development of resources. So that's course content or course design, um, having the end user's voice integral in that whole process. So, and working as partners. And um, I, I think this is a phenomenal um, program that UBC has decided to support here in having students' voices in partnership, and I can talk about that later, what the partnership looked like, but right from the start of the project. Thanks. And Gail, do you wanna just briefly describe your funded project? Yeah, just briefly. Um, it was actually the students were taking the lead on deciding what elements of the course they really wanted to put their attention on to uh, potentially make it uh, a more, um, robust learning experience uh, for the students. So I'll talk again uh, later about my two students, uh, uh, partners that uh, I was working with and um, how they had different perspectives about the course. So um, it was just uh, updating, uh, reintroducing reintro greater accessibility and navigation in the Canvas shell was one of the, the um, outcomes as well as uh, some resources that we use in the course. So resource development as well. Thanks, Gail. Roslyn. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll kind of just start out by describing our project. And um, our project revolved around uh, the class Visa 401B, which is basically an undergrad open studio class um, where students, um, the aim is to basically find like your unique artistic voice and also you're um, going to develop an independent body of work. And so like the main method for feedback uh, within these classes is um, the critique. And it while it is uh, fundamentally valuable, 
It's uh, often kind of imbued with a level of bias and uh, colonial power dynamics that can um, privilege certain voices over others. Um, for example, in my experience as a student, I have um, witnessed um, and also experienced situations where, for example, an artwork was making a racial or cultural reference and it wasn't receiving the same kind of uh, generous feedback as other artworks. Um, and I mean, there could be a variety of reasons for this, which I can get into later, but um, for our team, this brought up a lot of questions around um, what a good crit actually is and if there are other ways in which it can exist and if um, we can implement uh, decolonial strategies within the art studio critique. Um, yeah, so our, our team really came together with this uh, shared investment in wanting to re-examine this tool, especially since it usually goes um, unquestioned. So it was an area really worth uh, looking into. And in recognizing kind of this need to decolonize the practice, um, our project basically aimed to make way for alternative methods um, for providing feedback um, on artwork by focusing on uh, various community building exercises and also rethinking these critique methodologies. Um, and I think ultimately we sought to kind of uh, challenge and complicate these pre predominant narratives within the Western art canon. And um, fundamentally, this is a collaborative work. It's between uh, the class, it's between students and faculty. And I don't think there is any other way that we could have gone about it that isn't horizontal. So um, yeah, SAP being a partnership between students and faculty kind of ended up being the perfect uh, vessel to do this work. Thanks, Rosalind. Natalie. Yeah, um, so my interest in our SAP project uh, stemmed really from my interest in the course itself at first. Um, when I took Forest 304, I was highly interested in the course content, and I really liked the way that the course was delivered and structured. Um, so when I got that call to join this project, I was very intrigued because as a student, I had only ever seen these methods of feedback of kind of either going to office hours and talking or maybe filling in these end of term surveys. But when you actually have this opportunity to sit down at a round table and talk with your professor and other students about your perspectives and their perspectives, I thought that was really amazing that you would have that chance to share and build something together towards the course. Um, to describe the funded project um, mentioned earlier, it was called Implementing Course Mastery Tracking Through Student Revised Learning Objectives. Um, the second part, student revised learning objectives, was really the main focus of the first portion of our project. We were basically breaking down all of the course content and the learning objectives that went with it. And we went, OK, which one of these uh, may be needed or not needed? And how do students versus professors read them differently? Um, the main point was that a lot of the time the student may see a learning objective, but they're not really sure what they are supposed to do with it. So when we have the students and professors come together, you can really get a better understanding um, and hopefully create an objective that is um, most useful and aligned with the student's learning. And then to follow that, we then linked all of those student uh, objectives um, with the Canvas um, tool known as the Mastery Tracking Notebook, um, which we will touch on a little bit later. Thanks, Natalie and Bosung. Uh, so Natalie and I were in the same forestry project team. Uh, looking back, I believe that the idea of partnering with a student, especially those who have previously taken the course, was a fantastic opportunity to directly address the needs and experiences of learners in this course. Uh, in all my other projects, I always stress the importance of gathering student feedback and because this feedback can help the project understand how effective the educational intervention that we made to the environment. There will be many other times we can also consider student voices to create more effective educational experiences. So this project was a great opportunity where I can experience student active participation in the process. If I make another like, just the additional comment about the forestry project. Uh, by using the outcomes tool and the learning mastery gradebook on Canvas, uh, we hope the student can assess how well they are doing on each learning outcome 
so they can plan what they need to study more. For faculty, monitoring the mastery progress of all students, uh, we thought that it can help them quickly identify areas where students are struggling. So this knowledge can help faculty better adjust to their teaching strategy, focusing on a specific area that need more explanation or different instructional or assessment method. Thanks, Bosung. So I heard a number of things. I heard um, emphasis on a horizontal approach. Rosalind, you really highlighted that, that you know, with the goals of trying to decolonize this studio critique, needing to have that be a horizontal process. I heard Bosung, from your perspective, this notion of you know, a meaningful way for active student engagement um, in, in the project, rather than just perhaps uh, gathering student evaluation feedback, which um, I also heard Natalie speak to, like, as a student, I go to office hours, I share my ideas, I, I provide feedback and evaluation, but like, what's more beyond that? What, what, how can I be involved in reshaping the course in, in a meaningful way? So thank you to, to all of you for touching on kind of the reasons that you um, chose to get involved in this initiative. Marissa, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so the next question we have for the panelists, um, each of you contributed to a project as a partner. What did you learn? And I know you learned a lot. So maybe just some key highlights about what you learned about partnership through working in this partnership. And we can start off with Selena. Yeah, so for this question, my answer will be like, um, partnership like SAP um, project was really different from how, like how conventional project with other professors worked for me in past experience. Because usually when I worked with the professors, it was more like professors already have the decision on how the process should work. But throughout, but then for the partnership it was more like we decide how to take the process together and have a feel for like where we can share the opinions um, back and forth. And it was a great opportunity because like we could, because from the, for example, like if the students bring an idea or if we bring an idea, the professors can give like um, another opinion about like practicality or like efficiency of the idea and have a discussion back and forth. But from my past experience, that was a little bit less happening because the process was already set forward. So yeah, I think that was what I learned from the partnership. Thanks, Selena. And Natalie? Yeah, so I think in this partnership, I really want to focus on the fact that it was a very um, coming together over a mutual interest and investment towards, in this case, education. And I think everyone within the project came into it having already taken the initiative to either propose the project or read through what it meant, and they really wanted to join it. So when you come together, this partnership, like Celine mentioned, was very different from what's conventional, as you have this chance to talk in a small group with various other people who also have different or similar ideas regarding the course um, and collaborate over our learning objectives, our question banks, and how we're going to engage students within the course. Um, I think in terms of the point of a partnership within SAP itself, um, partnership I've learned really focuses more on how the partnership is done rather than what might come of it. And I think that was a really great learning experience for myself, being able to just sit down and share all my thoughts without worrying about what might happen with them. To get critique from other one, uh, other people and to also share my own thoughts too was really, really great. Thanks, Natalie. And, and just for everyone, um, a reminder that Natalie and Selena are both student partners. And so now we're gonna hear from John who was a staff partner on some of the projects. Yeah, so, um... A students as partner has been an opportunity for me to reflect on my role and relationship as an educational developer and learning designer between what typically is between faculty or staff and that now includes students and so it's allowed me to recognize and appreciate the role of students as equal partners and voices in course design and i can better understand their stakes in building a really successful learner-centered course. It's also enabled me to practice flexibly and intentionally in my role um, as a consultant versus as an actual course developer. And also um, 
knowing when to balance both um, in this role. Thanks, John. Yeah, so from the three of you, I think all of you spoke to some very similar things about your learning and partnership. It sounds like, um, you know, Selena, you talked about uh, in your previous work with, with partnership, it's more professors coming in and making the decisions ultimately at the end and having these predisposed expectations. Um, and, and so not, you and Natalie explained how now it's like, your voices are more important, more ingrained in, in these projects and and also having that equal investment and motivation to achieve a common goal. So all of you are motivated, you come with your expertise um, and uh, on what you wanna see these courses look like and um, how to improve courses for student learning. And um, I, I really like how that was reflected in your responses. Um, and with John, you know, having your your unique expertise as a course de designer, but also you recognizing that now as a course developer and redesigner, you're you're taking on this new perspective almost on how important student voices are in redesigning courses um, and learning on how you can uh, incorporate that in your own work, even outside of SAP. Thank you, three, the three of you. And now I think I'll pass. Oh, wait, um, are question. we? Yes, question. I realized we, we didn't pause yeah. for the last <laughs> yeah. question for questions. So now is a good time to see if there are any questions so far that folks have bubbling away for the panelists. Feel free to use the chat. Feel free to raise your hand. Any questions so far? OK, let's continue on. Polina. Oh, hang on. We did get a chat. Rohan asks, are the student participants students who've attended the course previously, or are they students currently enrolled in the course? So who wants to briefly speak to that? Um, I can talk about it. So for me, I and I think also now I think we were the students who participated, like who attended the course previously. So we completed the course before we started the project. And can I just add to my course? Uh, I had a student who had previously taken the course and also one that was about to enter the course. So it was really capturing those reflections from the past student and the aspirations of what the incoming student wanted to learn in the applied public health nutrition course. Great. And I'll also just add, we have funded projects where the student partners came from outside the discipline. So I can think of a project in biology where the instructor brought in a student partner from education. Um, given the scope of the course, it made sense to do that. So there's lots of flexibility. Jasmine? Hi, yeah, thanks everyone for your, for your presentation so far. And I think this is just such important work. And I'm just thinking about, um, you know, when, when we're talking about partnership, there's a whole science to partnership. And I wonder for those, uh, as you were planning your engagement of students, were there frameworks that you were following to think about, you know, what is what is meaningfully engaging um, your, your students as partners to help guide that process? Who would like to speak to that? Uh, I, I can uh, just share, I did not have an intentional framework. Um, however, uh, based on past experiences of uh, when our faculty adapted to moving courses online due to COVID, um, I had some experience of engaging students uh, before a course starts. So typically with TAs, you don't have access to TAs until as uh, I think it was Selena was saying, the course is already designed and you know the instructor is ready to sort of run with that design. Uh, so when COVID came along, we had students uh, as research assistants. And so we I used that sort of experience to help guide me through the Students as Partners project. So I'm not sure if that really answers your questions, but I just relied on my past experience. Yeah, thanks, Jill. I appreciate that. Yeah, right. I was just going to say that I, I think, yeah, experience is, in, is incredibly important. And I think, um, you know, having these conversations also opens up opportunities to learn from perhaps other disciplines where, for example, we have 
you know, an area of like integrated knowledge translation where we look at what is meaningful engagement of say patient partners or clinician partners. And I think, you know, the, the experiences that you share, Gail, I think are very similar to what we see in the literature in engaging patients and clinicians as partners as we do with students as partners. Um, so yeah, maybe there's an opportunity to, to kind of cross pollinate those ideas. Thanks. Wonderful. I see a few more questions um, and I see a few comments. So just to speak to some of these, um, thank you, Chris, for chiming in around um, how your team navigated. You did the partnership work while both um, Annika and Rosalind were enrolled in the class. So instead of prior to, it was ongoing while they were taking the course. And then um, just see a few other questions around, um, is it typical to apply for the grant first and then later find students? Um, that's certainly possible. Um, although we're, I think, seeing more and more folks come to to submit proposals together already as as sort of early partners um, starting off that work. So just highlighting that. There's a couple other questions. We'll try to fold them into the next um, round as we keep moving forward. Belina, I'll pass things over to you. Thanks, Rosalind. So our next question is for the student partners. Um, as you know, partnership is a dynamic process. So there can be ups and there can be downs. Um, so what kinds of opportunities or challenges uh, did you encounter during your partnership? Anakin. Hi, yeah, I, I really resonate with some of the, um, the framing of the SAP framework as being a horizontal structure to work inside of. Um, and I think working inside of that structure and was a, like provided a really neat opportunity for myself, I know, to um, rethink a lot of the ingrained assumptions that I have about how power structures operate in the classroom. Um, specifically, as we mentioned, as Rosalind mentioned, our project was about feedback, which is often a really like kind of spooky, like you're being evaluated and you're, you're kind of on the hot seat when your work's getting uh, critiqued and it can be really vulnerable. Um, and so I think it was a really incredible opportunity for me to be a part of this project to reflect on my responsibility um, to be a be an active participant um, of creating like critical and community oriented uh, learning spaces. Um, and yeah, just think through some of the ways that I could become more of like an active participant in the class, um, rather than just kind of like a passive sort of like consumer of the class um, and kind of, it, uh, I guess, rejecting some of those like pre-existing structures of um you know the teacher you know the instructor determines like what's going to happen in the class and how things are going to be done to um to kind of letting myself realize that you know there are things that I can contribute um and that um, as someone who is also enrolled in the class while we were doing this work um that I have like a responsibility to also um facilitate um opportunities for other class members who weren't a part of the project to also um, bring their voices and their um, interests and concerns to the table as we were rethinking how to have feedback um, in a more kind of yeah community oriented um, way that would that is in line with some of these decolon decolonizing kind of methodologies. Thanks, Aniki. Great points, uh, Selena. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the project itself was a really great opportunity as a student to give like more in-depth feedback or like opinions about the course to the instructors because like um sometimes like it's very it can be very anxious to give like a direct feedback on like what we found could become missing or can one well make some suggestions in terms of changes to the instructors or sometimes like also it's very hard to keep in track whether how the ex how the exact changes are being made in the course and afterwards after we give the um favorite feedbacks to the instructors. So in terms of that, like the SAP project was a really good, um, I would say um, it was a great environment for us to like keep constantly check like how our feedback is directly being implemented into the course and how like, and how we can modify it better in terms of the course. And one challenge I've encountered during the partnership is that um, definitely it was because of the course, like because of the, um, project structure, it kind of took me some time to get used to it because as I said before, it was kind of different. It was kind of different from how conventionally other projects work with different professors. So it just took me some time to get used to it. 
Thanks, Selena. Natalie? Yeah, um, I think for opportunity wise, a big one would have been working with um, a group of like minded individuals who were all who were all working towards a similar goal. I kind of mentioned that earlier as well, but being able to sit down and talk with a professor that I had been taught by um, regarding my thoughts about the course and also learning about their perspective regarding it was really insightful for me. Um, but I think a newer one for me was learning about the implementation of technology, particularly Canvas, into our learning system. As a student, I have only ever really seen the student version where you get your assignments assigned and you just kind of do things on it. But interacting with the website and seeing the depth of how much you can do with it was very, very interesting for me, particularly the um, Learning Mastery Gradebook that was mentioned earlier. Um, for some context, you basically link your learning objectives to particular questions within your quizzes or your assignments on Canvas. And through that, both the student as well as the professor can track how well a student has understood um, the concepts um, throughout the course. And it's a really great way for the student to be um, asking what should they be improving on and for the professor as well to be seeing which gaps may need to be filled within the course itself. Um, but I think the biggest one was really the opportunity to have an increased interest in my own learning and engaging with my own learning. Um, like we say, traditionally, you don't have much of an opportunity to engage with a course beyond attending it, maybe going to an office hour or giving your feedback in those end of term surveys. But when you have this chance to actually be in a discussion about how that course is going to be changed or revised, you have the opportunity to. Um, well, I guess you have the opportunity to be able to speak about your thoughts in a different way, in a more direct way. Um, and for me, that was really, really great. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, Anneke. Hi, yeah, I just realized I forgot to mention um, a challenge that I think is, um, I think, worthy like of, of bringing up. Um, and that was that um, in doing this work as a student partner in, a, in the SAP grant, um, because we were funded with like a, just a specific like out like a specific allocation of funding um we like only ended up having like only at like a few hours a week to do the work that we needed to do and specifically for our project that was like really concerned with like thinking about what it meant to decolonize a specific visual art uh pedagogy tool like tool and methodology um we were often re revisiting like what our project was, how we were like what decolonization like meant to us in the specific work that we were doing. Um, and so when that work, which is inevitably like, you know, deeply internal and also community oriented and like very um, complex needed to take more time than was allocated, we were kind of, I think, brought into a, an awareness of our position within this broader university structure of, you know, like, Rosalind and I as students were only getting paid to do this work for like what three hours a week or something versus there was you know there was more work that actually needed to get done and so our professor who is just because of the way the system works positioned to kind of like be more securely compensated for that extra work um it was just yeah I guess like I wanted to mention that as like a tension that we were kind of existing in um just the way that the kind of the funding works that even though we were trying to be like completely collaborative and work in this horizontal way. Um, there were sometimes uh, situations where our professor had to do more work because if Rosalind and I as students did it, we wouldn't be compensated. And so, yeah, just, I guess like a attention to kind of exist in and be aware of that we're operating in these um, broader like university contexts and funding um, models and structures. Absolutely. Thank you all for for mentioning it. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, higher up um, structurally, the challenges that come with working in these set structures, climbing the ladder, as Anneke mentioned, to partnership, um, to this new way of working and learning and, and teaching and this new way of working together. Um, but also from the perspective of a, as a student partner na navigating the interpersonal um, elements of you know what does feedback look like um, how do you go and like um, natalie said how do you see that other perspective even 
on a technological level from Canvas, right? Um, it's all very new. And I think this newness is, is what I was hearing in all your responses. Um, thank you all. This was really great. I'll pass this off to uh, Roslyn. Great. And I'm noticing the chat is bubbling with questions and, and panelists chiming in with um, comments and, and responses. So I want to pause and see if there's any questions that haven't been addressed that were either in the chat and that have come up since listening to this last panelist um, question. So any questions that folks have right now? Okay, that means that the chat has been doing its job. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna turn things over to faculty partners. So Christine and Gail, what opportunities and challenges did you encounter uh, during your partnership work? So Christine. Hi everyone. Um, of course, challenges in that old cliche results in opportunities. <laughs> Um, so uh, I think I'll try and keep it slightly brief, but one of the uh, biggest challenges that I faced, and perhaps even the student partners faced, was a misalignment of expectations. So I think that um, you kind of have assumptions of definitions of what decolonizing might mean or how that uh, those values might play a role in the classroom. Um, and then you actually maybe do a little bit of a feedback <laughs> gathering and you find out that there's a bit of a mismatch. And um, I, I, I think that was the most eye-opening um, uh, moment I had, um, which was you know, the attitudes towards academia, the attitudes towards what um, counts as good work in my discipline. Um, and, and the values that we have on these more social justice lenses of, of decolonizing might not actually be shared values. Um, and so the, the partners and I, I think, maybe aligned a bit more. But then when we brought in the voice of the classroom, uh, it started to lose its uh, direction a little bit. And so um, I think what came out of this mismatch was I became incredibly aware of um, certain perceptions or expectations that I either had to realign or dismantle. Um, one of them being um, that decolonizing should make everything easier uh, for everybody. <laughs> um, but that's not necessarily true. Decolonizing is a very difficult, complex, nuanced, critical work, and it actually makes things harder. Um, so I think that's what I started to uh, gain from, from this misalignment was um, how to build a better vocabulary, um, how to take the time to align our values or, or see where they're coming from, uh, a little bit more time for uh, a bit of the buy-in, you know, of, uh, of why it is I'm using these particular methods or why we're going to expand them or revise them. Um, so I think that was uh, one of the, the, the most challenging components of this and, and uh, maybe even uh, between the student partners and their peers in the class. Um, but it was also the most revealing because I think I became more confident in why I make certain decisions or why I would revise certain methods uh, towards certain decisions in the classroom and, and what they end up uh, bringing forth that I value in, in pedagogy, in facilitation. Uh, the other thing I became incredibly aware of is some things that you don't witness in class. Uh, so homework you might give <laughs> might actually have a lot more um, weight than you'd ever imagine. So uh, we, I think as faculty members, we tend to assess what's happening in the classroom because that's where we can gain knowledge. Um, but through the partnership, I actually started to become more aware of what was happening outside of the classroom, certain assignments that were bringing people together, um, uh, things that were unfolding in the homework time. So that was incredibly revealing, having uh, student partners that were so invested in uh, this idea of building a community, community as sort of a pedagogical purpose. 
Um, they revealed to me quite candidly a lot of really interesting insights that I would never have uh, understood if I didn't have this partnership. So I, I'd say as a third sort of um, uh, opportunity and challenge that I encountered during this partnership, it was just genuinely fulfilling to talk about what it is that we do in the classroom with the people that are directly impacted. And so I, I'd say it just brought me a lot of pleasure in how I was making decisions in the classroom and how I was seeing things unfold. So there's my little spiel. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. And I also want to highlight that your project for folks that um, might not have caught the distinction in the beginning when you were describing it was um, more of a, a co-creation of the curriculum. So where the student partners and the class and you all came together to work on um, revising the course as it was in motion versus um, perhaps the other two projects uh, that have been talked about today, which were um, more redesign prior to offering the new version of the course. So just want to highlight that um, difference between the two. And for those that are interested, we can talk more about co-creation, perhaps a little later when we have some open Q&A time. Um, Gail. Okay, yeah. So uh, uh, just like Christine, I think challenges can become opportunities. And um, I'd say probably from my perspective, the greatest challenge uh is really um breaking down that vertical and flattening out that vertical structure that students are so have so ingrained in their um sense of academia so i think that for me um you know certainly i had worked with one of the students before previously um and knew the sort of the openness to uh, a, a working in a flat or more horizontal way uh, as partners. Uh, the other student um, who was the incoming student into the course, uh, I had not worked with her before, but uh, was very open to bringing her perspectives forward. So I think for me, the biggest challenge was um, just ensuring that we're working sort of in a in a horizontal plane um although it can kind of go like this right you know sometimes and um and i think that that provided opportunities because over time what we what i saw happening is that the students were much more um, the process was unfolding the students were much more willing just you know off the cuff to say things um and provide their perspectives on whatever the component was that we were working on. Um, so yeah, the biggest challenge kind of turned into opportunities because I feel like the students also just felt more comfortable as a partner uh, as time went on. And uh, I know I certainly welcome that. Um, as I mentioned before, I think, end users voices of resources that we develop. Uh, really, I think it's critical to have them right from square one. Uh, so I'd say that um, it is almost like what uh, Selena was talking about, how you were feeling a little bit uncomfortable, uh, but you were going through the process of unlearning <laughs> the vertical structure and learning to work more horizontally. And I think that that stood out for me the most. Um, I certainly, um, from my perspective, I saw the students as partners and sometimes we would take a lead. So we'd go through round tables, discussions and different people would take leads on different parts of this discussion. So that was always really um, an interesting process. Uh, and also I think, uh, a developmental process for for everybody involved to incorporate other people's ideas when you're taking the lead on a discussion of you know redesigning the canvas shell that that can affect everyone so um yeah i really liked that the students uh felt comfortable you know towards the end of 
you know, really buying in and uh, taking responsibility for or seeing a different way of how they could um, deepen their learning, uh, their learning process, not just for the course content itself, but the transferable skills. So the leadership skills, the communication skills, um, partnership skills. What is it like to be a partner? Uh, so, yeah, so I think that a lot of those challenges did turn into positives um, in the project itself. Thanks, Christine and Gail. Um, I just wanted to pull up a question because um, I think you two could perhaps start us off and then we can open it up. Rohan asks, is there such a phenomenon as a conflict of interest during such partnerships and how were such instances navigated? Would either of you like to speak to that? It's um it's a good question because uh, my my student team part as student partners were very aware of it perhaps being an issue and in the very first class we set up a sort of um, introduction to what the project was and an assurance to the class of of the um, uh, limitations and. Uh, it's almost like we we spent more time establishing this student as partners project uh, as a sort of facilitation rather than uh, the content of it. <laughs> um, and so we we anticipated it might have been an issue that students in the class might think that, you know, they would get better marks or, you know, getting to know them would help, you know, communicate for better marks or something like that. We were worried. Um, but I would say that it ended up not being much of a problem at all, although maybe the students feel differently. But I, I felt like that was something we had uh, worried about a little, were concerned about, and then it it didn't actually uh, breed any sort of <laughs> off <laughs> situations. And, and maybe that is because it had such transparent directions in it. Um, but Gail, did you uh, feel that way in... So I'm just going to say uh, our situation was a little bit different. So while we were designing uh, new learning activities, um, developing scenarios for the students to go through, uh, redesigning the canvas shell for better navigation and accessibility, so thinking about um, diversity and uh, inclusion, those sorts of concepts, um, we did not implement that in this year. So it is coming in the next iteration of the course. So the student that was actually taking the course at the time uh, had access to a Canvas uh, sandbox, but minus assessments, like uh, quiz types of assessments. So, so there was no um, advantage for that student other than seeing what the lesson plans were that were coming forward. And um, once the course started, we released those anyhow. So it wasn't, I don't, if I'm getting to um, sort of uh, Rohan's question, I'm not sure I'm actually nailing it on the head, but in terms of conflict of interest of our student that was taking the course at the time of the re revisions, um, there was really not nothing to really, um, yeah, uh, nothing that would influence or, or provide an advantage for that student. I hope that answers your question, Rohan. Rohan, does that answer your question? Feel free to chime in or use the chat. And yes, yes, it does. Um, one of the things I'm always interested in, and I think Christine talked about it, was the idea of expectations. So perhaps I should have said a conflict of expectations rather than of interest, although I think they are very similar. Um, and considering projects like these involve so many kinds of participants, I feel there's multiple kinds of interests and expectations that need to be managed. Um, and that would be on an ongoing basis. So when I posed the question, I was looking at, looking at it from a, a generative productive point of view of how they would be actively managed over the course of the, the partnership. So that's what I was really interested in. And I was, um, um, it's, I'm, I'm really glad that I have these two different perspectives uh, from, uh, from Christine and, and Gail about, about entirely different circumstances. One where um, you address the issue upfront 
And in the other case, it's it's taken up, I think, in a more ongoing basis. But at the same time, there's really no, um, uh, uh, I'd say, a, a gray area where there's a possibility of students feeling, or I think at least the enrolled students feeling uh, disenfranchised. Thanks, Rohan. Okay, um, I'm going to pass things over to Marissa to move us forward. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so far we've heard from the student and the faculty partners. So now I wanna turn our attention to the staff partners. Um, for context, each SAP project was provided learning design support. Um, so this is geared towards John and Bosung who were learning design, um, offered learning design support for SAP projects. So, you know, as staff partners providing learning design support, what opportunities and challenges did you encounter? Yeah, so for for my projects, I think um, these partnerships provided great opportunities for shared decision making and course design, but also like understanding and assuming shared the shared risks in those decisions, but also understanding, you know, there are sh shared rewards as well. Um, it also created opportunities beyond the literature. I feel. Um, uh, in, in terms of like best practices and cor course design and like building off new and emerging uh, ideas from these students. Um, and especially thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, um, uh, creating a teaching presence. So I thought those were like the key opportunities um, from these student voices. In terms of like challenges, I think for me, um, the number one challenge was actually just balancing my role because uh, I'm typically involved in the meat, in the development, in the design, and and now it um, has been um, really uh, allowing the students or giving the students a space to design and develop an experiment on their own, and recognizing that. They are amazing, and um, and and they're developing these pieces in in the course um, that are going to that have really been informed by their their own perspectives, um, and so really just balancing my role as just a, a, a sage on the stage more, and um, and then guiding work where I where but where it's needed, but it's really just. Um, giving the students a voice in their in, in their own development work. Thanks, John. Uh, Bo Sang. Um, so, as, you know, for this kind of project, the step members are often assigned to a project once the project get funded. So it can take time for the project team to understand the skills and support we can offer. And equally, it can take us some time to see where we can best contribute. And I agree with John about balancing our role and task. That was uh, another thing that we can consider. We need to consider. Additionally, uh, I think scheduling meetings that work for everyone was a bit of a challenge. Uh, sometimes the meeting were scheduled and late night, and then when I cannot attend or have to attend via Zoom while others join in person. Uh, but these challenges may not be just for the students as partners project. Uh, for this particular project, I think I was fortunate to have the opportunity to be involved even before the project was funded. So, uh, I, first got to, uh, I first got to know the professor the faculty partner through the learning design consultation. And later he reached out to me for the SAP proposal feedback. So this early involvement enabled us to plan, uh, you know, discuss the project and plan things together uh, where he, the project might need my support throughout the project and then where we need some student uh, perspectives support uh, Professor Bahola also did an excellent job in coordinating and managing the project. So I had a better understanding about the project progress uh, throughout the 
you know, throughout the project and uh, was able to provide the support when it is needed. The specific opportunity that I grabbed from this project was that I finally had a chance to see how this outcomes tool and learning mastery gradebook on Canvas can be implemented. Um, this tool is not something new. It has been there for a while, but uh, despite its potential to enhance teaching and learning, this tool has been largely underutilized at UBC. And I also had the opportunity to collaborate with the LT Hub because we share the same interest about this tool. Uh, so throughout the project, we encountered both challenges and benefit of using this outcomes tool and a learning mastery grade book. Uh, but despite some hurdles, we, I believe that our experience in learning can be served as valuable resources for other faculty who may wish to leverage this tool in their uh, courses. So it kind of in, uh, gave, gave me also opportunity to enhance my understanding about the use of this tool, uh, including having some student perspective. Thank you. Thanks both Sang and John. And I, um both of you offer really valuable insights into some of the opportunities and and also some of the challenges that you've encountered i um, mean i just want to be mindful of time i know we have a few more questions um so if anyone has any burning questions um that that you'd like us to talk through right now uh, i'll give you a second um i'm also seeing that Lots of people, panelists yes. are chiming in to respond in chat, to questions yeah. in the chat, which is wonderful because we're able mm -hmm. to then answer more questions as we're working our way through. So why don't we move ahead and then um, we'll see if questions come forward. So Polina. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, so a question uh, that we have is what occurred during your partnership that you didn't anticipate or expect? That's to Rosalind. Yeah, um, I think entering this project, there was a lot of things that we didn't anticipate or expect. Um, and that's kind of what, part of what made the experiencing so enriching. Um, but I, uh, I will say, I think one of the biggest surprises actually happened pretty early on. And that was um, basically being accepted to speak on the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the art student art history uh, classroom panel um, at the College Arts Association Conference in New York. And yeah, that was a definitely a surreal moment for us. Um, but it was actually kind of the process of preparing for the panel and of writing together that ended up being a very um, enriching moment uh, for our partnership. Um, yeah, and like, I mean, the, the presentation is very short, um, so we had to go through this process of like, like kind of getting our ideas down to their core. Um, and in this, like in this process, I think we were pushed to think more um, profoundly about what our project actually is and what it means. Um, yeah, and like through kind of this process, we were exchanging perspectives, we were challenging each other, and I think we ended up not just learning about our project, but um, as Annika and Christine have um, also touched on, we we were learning about our own uh, approaches and assumptions. Um, and at, I think at this point, we had to kind of confront our own biases in terms of what uh, decoloniality um, means. Um, and it was through this reflection of uh, redesigning the crit um, of, we, we kind of like realized that there there are aspects to it that could be considered uh, wicked wicked problems um, because of, for example, contradictory solutions, and also there not being a single solution. And this ended up being kind of like uh, I think a breakthrough moment for us, and also a huge point um, within our presentation for that panel. Um, and yeah, I, I think we had this feeling pretty early on, and. Uh, it was at this point that we were able to develop the language to realize that there isn't a one size fits all solution to crit. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time in the beginning just exploring, like we did lit reviews, we did focus groups, and we did various like class activities. Um, and for a while, things felt a bit disjointed in terms of like what we actually wanted to do with our project. So yeah, it's interesting. Like we 
just for the in the process of making a 10 minute presentation, we found out, I think, way more about our project than in the months spent exploring. Um, and yeah, like when you're running a project like this, it's easy to get caught up in kind of the nitty gritty and like you kind of get caught up in your own mindset mindset. But like when you take a moment to step back, there's so much um, broadening and learning and reflection that can happen. And also um, beyond this, I think we were just excited to see our conversation extend beyond just the scope of the uh, the course and uh, contribute to a larger audience that was interested in the same things as us. Um, and yeah, it was a great opportunity to see and learn from other presentations and also um, see how they approached it. Um, and I also wanted to take just a moment to acknowledge the Students as Partners Dissemination Fund, which was definitely helpful and uh for the getting this opportunity for us. Um, and yeah, coming back from the experience, uh, I think we were kind of able to see our project with fresh eyes and we had like a, a better sense of our direction in terms of like where we wanted to go with the project. Thanks, Rosalyn. You said it all. I was about to mention the dissemination fund. Um, but yeah, it sounds like that process gave you an extra added opportunity to reflect on the project and sort out those big ideas in a way that I think enhanced your partnership overall, it sounds like. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. Last question for the panel, and then we're going to wrap up and talk about a few other things before we let folks go. Yeah. So um, the question that we're posing to our panelists are, what guidance or suggestions do you have to others who are interested in working in partnership? And what, both sides? Um, so in any collaborative project, I think it's quite normal for different members to contribute at varying times. So it can often take a while for the project team to fully understand the unique skill and support that or perspectives that each member can offer. And depending on their role and task, certain members might be more involved during specific phases of the project than others. Uh, since the, I think the uh, SAP project aims to provide an opportunity for every partner to voice and learn from each other. So having regular project team meetings that involve or that involve all members can provide space for members to listen to others' perspectives and learn from each other and help all participating members develop some clear understanding and voice out about the project task and timeline uh, and give them opportunity to contribute. Uh, however, scheduling meetings that works for everyone can be challenging due to the involvement of the many people with different schedule and uh, different commitment. I think in such case, regular update or having someone assigned uh, with a specific role of the coordinating communication and organizing meeting memo, I think could help. Sharing a timeline, clear task and milestone can also help all partner understand the project progress. I think that only that not only keeps everyone on the same page, but also create opportunity for every partner to contribute to the project and not left out and learn from each other. Uh, and it can also enhance the overall outcome of the project. Also, I think since we are opening the door to listen to everyone, like every partner. Uh, I think we should be ready to make some adjustment on the way. Be open-minded. I think that uh, is one recommendation that I want to make. Thank you. Thanks, Bosan. And Gail? Uh, yeah, I would just say, I think uh, for when you're forming the group, that it's really important to make sure students and faculty are um, using the same language. So what is a partnership and understanding that uh, sort of right from the get go, right? So right from the start of the partnership, what is a partnership? How do we want it to look like? And that 
could change over time as, as, as I saw in my own project, um, students becoming much more comfortable in just sharing their ideas. Um, at first, I really felt like they were looking to me uh, for that guidance, but I would prefer just to say this is a partnership right out, out of the gate and say uh, sort of have you been involved in partnerships before and what did they look like and how do we want this one to unfold? Um, knowing fully well that we'd need to be flexible uh, as things may not go as planned. Uh, but I agree with Bosung about the scheduling. <laughs> oh, that was, um, <laughs> that was challenging. Um, yeah, when students are taking four other courses or five courses, uh, it's very challenging to find some time to meet. Uh, so, yeah, that I, I think setting up a standing meeting time right at the start would be beneficial there. Um, yeah, and and just you know maintaining as a a moving from a vertical to horizontal kind of structure, uh, maintaining that throughout. Like I think it's as a responsibility. As an instructor, we we have, um, whether it's intentional or not, perpetuated that vertical structure for a lot of things. And this is an opportunity to flatten it and that we need to make that really clear, take that responsibility on to make it clear that everybody's voices are equal here. Um, and then and then it just you know becomes natural over time, at least with my group uh, that I was working with, um, yeah. It just becomes natural as people build that trust and build those relationships amongst everybody on the team. Yeah, so I think that's some guidance I, I would highly recommend if you're thinking about applying that um, uh, do it. Uh, there's a lot of learning. Uh, the students gain a lot. Uh, faculty members gain a lot um, in terms of working as partners, as actual partners on a project to better and improve the learning environment for future students. So I, I, I'd i say go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Gail and Bosang. Um, a very common theme of what I've heard from both of you and from what I hear from a lot of different partnership groups is establishing um, your expectations, your meeting times, all of those logistical pieces at the very beginning helps to set the tone for the partnership. I mean, I really appreciated, Gail, what you mentioned about having a conversation and reflecting on what is partnership and what does that mean to each per individual um, coming to the partnership. And also just taking time to reflect, as you know, things change and, and throughout the partnership process, um, just taking time as a partnership team to reflect on how things are going um, and where you wanna go from there. Thank you all to the panelists for this very rich discussion. Um, I, do we have, Roslyn, what do you think? Do we want some time for questions or do we want to keep? We have a few Let's see if we things. have any bubbling questions at the moment. I, I see the chat it, again has been really busy and mm -hmm. thanks everyone for chiming in there. Any last questions before we transition to wrap up, which will be Marissa talking a bit about evaluation work and us talking about the upcoming call. Any last questions for anybody? Okay, well, let's move ahead. And again, if questions do come, we still have 10 minutes or so that the chat can be a, a place and space for those to, to pop up. Um, let's talk a little bit about what lies ahead. So Marissa, I'm gonna hand things yeah. over to you. Great, thank you. So um, as part, as I mentioned at the very beginning, my role is the evaluation specialist for SAP. So that involves helping individual projects with their evaluation, um, whether it's survey development, how do they want to evaluate their project overall, but then also in the bigger grand scheme of things, um, the SAP initiative was funded for two years. And so my role is to see, to evaluate the whole initiative. And one of the ways that I've been doing that is through the, what I call the SAP partnership project. So um, we can, thank you. So this was a project that's approved um, by UBC BREB. And ideally what we're studying is what are the impacts of the SAP initiative on the student and faculty and staff partners? 
Um, what are the benefits and challenges that we've already talked touched on here um, about partnership work? And then how, if at all, does the SAP initiative contribute to the and enhanced learning experience for students at UBC Vancouver? So the participants have been everyone involved in the partnerships from students to faculty to staff. And what that has looked like is I have met one on one with uh, each person to do a semi structured interview, uh, getting at the challenges, the benefits, what kind of learning experiences they've had. Um, and but mostly at the heart of it is understanding this partnership, because that's very that's what we see as very unique to SAP. Um, and then on top, um, in addition to that, we do closure reports with each project team. So when they're when they're finished their project, they they get a written document that they fill out for us, which is data that we'll be able to use at the end to to evaluate. Um, you know how how is this initiative doing? Is it is it meeting the goals that we that it set out at the very beginning? Um, so next slide. Uh, so just uh, very briefly, I know we we did talk a lot about challenges and opportunities that have come with the SAP projects, but I really want to highlight. So to date, I've probably done about 30 interviews, I would say um, a lot of faculty, um, a few staff, and then um, probably about 12 or 13 students. So one of the major benefits that came across all interviews that i've done so far is just the relationships that have been developed through sap work so student from student side confidence in working with faculty um, creating meaningful relationships with students outside of teaching so a lot of faculty talked and even we heard today uh Bo Sung and john talking about these new relationships that they've had with students um, so really fostering that outside of the classroom and what that looks like. And then also trying to start breaking down those barriers of power dynamics. Um, we, you know, we work within the institution. And so there's there's only so much work that we can that can be done in such a short time. But we like to see it as the very beginning of breaking down these barriers. A couple quotes um, from a faculty we had, everyone has a unique perspective. And I think having an opportunity to share, this is where I'm coming from, this is who I am, I think that's really important. And then a student quote, um, I think it's just building the skills and the networks and then extrapolating everything that I learned from that and applying it to my professional and my personal life. Another of the benefits is the skill development. So students don't have the opportunity very often to uh, see what goes on behind the scenes of course development. So this was a really unique opportunity for students. And um, as Rosslyn had mentioned earlier, going to conferences, um, the dissemination fund that SAP offers students has been really helpful in giving students the opportunity to build their CV, get some conference presentations on it. Uh, and then learning how to communicate with faculty was another big thing that that came out of the SAP projects. Um, I I don't know if these slides are going to be available afterwards because I do, do we know? Can I? I don't think the slides necessarily, but I think there's potentially a recording. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So I uh, you know. As uh, I'll read then these quotes. So from a faculty perspective, as an educator, you get blinders on, you forget what it's like to be a student, you forget what it means to learn, um, and you forget that you're a singular course within an entire program. So you don't fully have the picture of how your content is being scaffolded and integrated into the curricula. Uh, so how do you create something that's effective? Uh, and the only way to do that, I think, is feedback from students, which has been a common theme throughout a lot of these projects. And then from a student perspective, um, I think that it just gives me a sense of what this work can look like because I didn't know anything about it. There's lots of postgraduate things that you can do that you'll need to show evidence and have a built CV. So to show that you've done certain types of work, have certain soft skills and leadership skills. And I just really thought this was a good opportunity to build these skills. Um, and then briefly, I'll just touch on some of the challenges. Um, and again, I know we we had a lot of discussion around this. So time, that's a, just a very logistical challenge that I think you had seen a lot of partnership work 
But as Gail alluded to earlier, when you have so many people involved in these projects, students who have five courses, um, it's, it is just hard to find the time. And then as Annika mentioned earlier, the, the funding, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, but only so many hours that students are going to be paid for. So how do we allocate our time and how do we prioritize things? So time was a, a big factor. And then lastly, another challenge that came up was the power dynamics, which, you know, as I said earlier, we're, we're really trying to work at breaking down, coming from this vertical structure to working horizontally. Uh, but that is just, that is just the way we've been working and operating for years and for decades and decades. And so just really at the start of that is, is trying to, to work on these power dynamics and, um, so not surprisingly, this is one of the challenges as well. Thank you, Marissa. And I know there's lots lots more to come. That's just the tip of the iceberg of all the wonderful work that you've been doing to really understand the impacts and outcomes of this initiative at UBC. So we want to end on a, a looking forward note of if you would like to apply. <laughs> so we are coming up to our um, fourth call for the students as partners in course design grants. And so as you've probably uh, gleaned by now, there's two um, funding opportunities available and they are related. So the first is the students as partners in course design grants. And so the idea is that we're supporting UBC Vancouver undergraduate students to work in partnership with faculty to redesign undergraduate courses. The sandbox is undergraduate students and undergraduate courses at UBC Vancouver. So unfortunately, graduate courses or courses at UBC Okanagan aren't eligible at this point. The funding that's available is $7,100 per course design or course redesign project. And all of that money except $100 must be used to support student partner remuneration. So when I know there's some discussion in the chat about number of partners that's sort of ideal. And so really, uh, you need to think about perhaps how that $7,000 could be distributed across the, the tasks and the partners, um, so on and so forth. Submission deadline for this upcoming call is June 16th at 3 p.m. And applications are accepted through our website, which is sap.ubc.ca. There's also a dissemination fund, which is available to funded students as partners projects. So um, you have to have a funded project in order to be eligible for the dissemination fund. And as Rosalind spoke to, um, her project team had a chance to go and present at a conference, um, an art education conference in, in New York with some funding available. And so there's $1,000 per project, um, not per student partner, but per project that is eligible for student partners only to uh, receive reimbursement for their costs associated with attending and presenting their students as partners work at a scholarly conference or event. So that's the funding that's available there. Um, we, Marissa, Paulina and I are happy to um, meet with folks individually if you have questions or are considering submitting a proposal. We highly encourage you to reach out um, just because uh, we're able to provide um, specific feedback um, and, and guidance around the kinds of things that you might think about in framing your students as partners project. We also encourage you to bring your student partners to um, that conversation so that they're also folded into and thinking about the proposal work. The best way to reach out to us would be through our email. Um, maybe Marissa or Polina, one of you two could put it in the chat. Thank you. And last but not least, we just wanted to highlight an upcoming um, event that we're really looking forward to. We have our first students as partners, we're calling it a forum. Really, it's a day of uh, in-person and or online learning. You can join in either method from 10 to 3.30 on June 6th. And we're celebrating and highlighting um, several funded students as partners projects who will give kind of lightning round presentations of their work. We have a, an international panel um, with two folks doing research and students as partners coming in to join us. And we have some workshops, one on power navigating power dynamics in students as partners work, and another one on disseminating students as partners work. That workshop will also highlight um, the uh, International Journal of Students as Partners and have uh, the editor of that journal come in and speak to opportunities for disseminating work there. 
So lots of learning. If that interests you, you can register through our website, um, which is listed here. And I think we're at 1230, maybe even 1231. So I want to just take this moment to thank everyone for making the time to come. I know we're always all so busy. So really appreciate you um, prioritizing this in your schedule. Also really want to thank the panelists. We simply couldn't have done this without you. And you're, again, you've all provided such thoughtful and insightful comments. So big, big thanks to everybody um, for, for your contributions today. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day.